Mm. So it's uh, our pleasure to have uh, Ada Algeri here as a speaker today. Um, so Ada completed her PhD in, in, in near Paris or in, in near Paris um, in Orsay in 2017, um, and then became a postdoc at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in, in Paris. Um, after that, um, and now since uh, not that long ago. She now obtained a, a permanent position in a laboratory on matter and complex systems at the Université de Paris. And um, that's one of her affiliations now. Um, and the topic for today is evidence of glassy phases in the random lock Volterra model and variants with finite demographic noise. So the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk today. So today I would like to discuss actually evidences of glassy phases in large interactive ecosystem. And this talk is essentially based on these two works. The first one has been posted in archive in September and the other one is very recent. So it has been posted in archive uh, this week. So over the past seven years, I have been working on different subjects related to disorder system with a special emphasis on spin glass models and amorphous system in the low temperature phase. And in particular, during my PhD, I worked on the connection between constraint satisfaction problem and the jamming transition, which is a rigidity transition that takes place inside the glassy phase at zero temperature. And then in the in the last three years, so let's say, so during my second postdoc at the Ecole Normale, I moved to slightly different subjects that are related on dynamical midfield theory on one end to achieve a better understanding of out of equilibrium dynamics in disordered system and deep neural networks. And on the other hand, theoretical ecology. And so I focused on the MacArthur model, which is a well-known resource competition model and lofka Cabaltura model with its variants. And so one of the main purposes of today's talk is basically to show that all these apparently different subjects are not so far away one from the other, but share a dense network of connection. And in particular, I want to point out the underlying connection between glassy system in the low temperature phase and large ecosystem that seem to be posted at the edge of stability. So understanding the mechanism that shape the diversity, stability, and functioning in ecological and biological, biological community is a very challenging problem, and it's very timely. And there are still a lot of open questions in theoretical ecology that range on how does the diversity affect the evolution of the other species? What about cooperative pattern formation? Are these patterns ordered? Are these patterns disordered? How does an ecosystem respond to an external perturbation? And is it possible to quantify these response functions in a similar way as we do for physical system? And again, is it possible to detect a multiple equilibrium regime for the same ecosystem or, or even more complex chaotic dynamics? So the field of theoretical ecology has gathered momentum in recent years, some are reached by an explosion of experimental results and increasingly sophisticated techniques trying to answer all these challenging questions. But the true novelty now compared to the past is that theoretical ecologists and physicists as well are no longer focusing on ecosystem formed by a few species, but on ecosystem formed by many, many species interacting in myriad ways in very complex settings. And so in this particular regime, in this particular limit, we can take advantage of statistical mechanics tools and statistical mechanics of disorder system to provide an effective midfield description and characterize emergent mechanism and collective behaviors in terms of phase transition. So for the sake of compactness, uh, I reported here just a few works that opened the route to this new approach, starting with Soleil, Alonso and McCain in 2000, um, sorry, in, uh, in 2002 and going on with Kessler and Streb in 2015. But I also want to mention this work by Tikhonov and Monasson uh, dating back to 2017 that we rephrased with Silvio Franz during my PhD in terms of a constraint satisfaction problem to show that constraint satisfability can be a good platform, a good um, mechanism to explain criticality in large ecosystems. So it can provide a complementary mechanism to self-organizing criticality, self-organizing instability, edge of chaos, 
to explain the fact that a lot of complex system in nature seem to be posed at the edge of stability. So, however, today I would like to touch up on another problem in theoretical ecology, another canonical model of disorder ecosystem, which is the randall of cavolterra model, which has been recently acknowledged to be a good platform, a good reference model uh, to capture many different features for various community models, including notably cascade prediction, plant pollinator, and resource consumers model as well, like the MacArthur model. And so the randall of cavolterra model uh, with many interacting components is described by this dynamical equation for the relative species abundances Ni, where I is an index that run from one to S and S is the total number of species in the species pool. So the dynamical equation is this one and contains a first self-regulating term, a forcing term, which is given by this gradient with respect to Ni of this one species potential. That in the Lofka-Volterra logistic growth case is modeled by this quadratic potential in the species abundances, where Ki is the current capacity. So as I said, is a self-regulating term in the sense that if one species experiences overcrowding its immediate environment, it will be pushed back to its own value of the current capacity, Ki. Then we have this interaction matrix, alpha ij, and since we want to add another source of stochasticity uh, besides this matrix alpha j, we add a noise, eti, which is a white noise with zero mean and covariance given by this expression. So as you can see, the covariance of the noise is proportional to uh, ni, so the relative species abundances. And for this reason, it's a demographic noise. And then we also put an immigration parameter lambda that should depend on the species, but at the first level analysis, we assume this lambda to be species independent. So the main assumption to get an exactly solvable model is to start from a well-mixed community, no space dependence, to model this noise uh, using etoformalism that allow us to consider Ni, so the relative species abundances, and eta i, the noise, uncorrelated at the same time, and so to attain an exactly solvable model. And then to tackle the staggering complexity of the ecosystem, we model this alpha j as random variables, parameter described by a ra so extracted from a given random distribution, which is parameterized by the first two moments. So mu over s is the mean of this alpha j, and sigma squared over rs is the variance of this alpha j. And so in taking this, uh, in using this assumption, we are essentially following Robert May, who was a pioneer in this field, and first studied stability and complexity in large ecosystem by using random matrix theory techniques. So the first simple case correspond to alpha j equal to alpha j i. So when these interactions are symmetric. So in the purely, in the completely symmetric case, the dynamical equation that I showed before has an invariant probability distribution uh, where this function, this function x, this energy function can be written in this way. So the Hamiltonian operators contain a first quadratic part um, that exactly came out from the one species potential, quadratic in the species abundances. Then we have this interaction uh, uh, part that depends on this random coefficient that I, I recall they are uh, completely symmetric, alpha j. And for this reason, we can establish a direct mapping between dynamics and statics. And then when we do this mapping between the dynamical approach and the static formalism to find a quasi-stationary probability distribution by passing through a Planck formalism, we, we also uh, obtain two other terms uh, that are the demographic noise, which is proportional to T log n, and another term uh, which is uh, properly introduced to model uh, this immigration parameter. So why this term and what is this theta function? So the theta function is the heavy side function. So the problem is that uh, when uh, uh, we want to prevent all the one species to reach very uh, small values, so to, to get very close to the boundary and i equal zero. And so to model this immigration, we basically put a cutoff at n i equal lambda. And so this is formally modeled by this ev side function. So when n i is greater than the lambda, these terms does not matter because the, the log of one is zero. But when an i is smaller than lambda, the ev side, the, the theta fun the EV side function is zero. And so the log of zero is minus infinity. 
that with a negative sign provide an archer uh, boundary, a reflecting wall. And so species uh, essentially are reflected and pushed back. So this is a, a particular trick uh, to avoid the uh, order in one species to reach um, a very small, to get very, very close to the boundary and i equals zero. So as you can see, without demographic noise and without immigration, mm -hmm. need, for, sorry, no, no. There are no quite, okay, sorry. Um, so without demographic noise and without immigration, these Hamiltonian exactly Raman has a spin glass Hamiltonian for people who are familiar with disorder system. And indeed, without demographic noise and without immigration, this model is, was first studied by Gebunin in 2017 and then rephrased by using random, uh, using random matrix theory techniques and replica method by Biroli, Bunin, and collaborators in 2018. And so in this phase diagram that we can say it has been obtained at zero temperature, so without demographic noise and without immigration, uh, they plot the heterogeneity parameter as a function of the mean interaction. And so, as you can see, at low heterogeneity or uh, a weak interaction, there is just one single equilibrium. Then we can pretend to increase the heterogeneity. And what happens? So the stability decreases upon increasing the heterogeneity up to this line. So this line is an instability line of the single equilibrium phase where the system becomes unstable and in unstable and enters a multiply equilibria phase. However, this phase was not explored into, into many details so far. And so one can wonder what are the typical property, uh, the typical properties of this equilibrium in this multiply equilibria phase. Um, and are they stable? Are they stable? Are they marginally stable? And how many equilibria are there? Are they exponential into the system size? Are they sub-exponential? So to better understand the properties of the equilibria here, we aim to study the role of this demographic noise and also to, to analyze into more detail the interplay between this demographic noise and this immigration parameter lambda that I repeat is modeled, is formally modeled as an hardcore repulsive boundary. So one possible strategy is to one possible strategy to deal with disorder system is to resort to the so-called replica method that allows us to write the disorder free energy in terms of the log of the disorder partition function replicated n times. And so since I don't want to enter into many details, but since we we need to average over these random variables alpha j that are extracted from a, uh, from a Gaussian distribution with mean nu over s and variant sigma squared over s, we need to introduce two additionally ordered parameters that are q and b, that is called overlap matrix. So it describes the degree of similarity between two configurations, so between copy A and copy B of the same system. And HA, with, in analogy with the magnetic system, is a sort of uh, average uh, um, spin. So it's a magnetization. And in this particular case, is the average abundance. And so given these premises, given the, the introduction of these two additional parameters, we can now write this free energy in terms of a log of the integral over this overlap matrix and this additional parameter HA. And since we are interested in the thermodynamic limits, so when S, the number of species goes to infinity, we can uh, take advantage of a saddle point approximation and basically extremize this action with the respect to the overlap and with the respect to the average abundance. And so the simplest scenario corresponds to what is called in jargon a replica symmetric ansatz, meaning that this matrix is just parameterized by two values, QD on the diagonal and Q0 on the off diagonal value, which is perfectly reasonable in the high temperature regime. But upon decreasing the temperature, so upon decreasing the demographic noise, these uh, replica symmetric ansatz become some feasible because it's not able, uh, it's no longer able to describe the emerging complexity of the landscape. And so we need to resort to a more structured, the more involved ansatz, which is called in jargon one step replica symmetry breaking. So rephrasing this metric structure in terms of the landscape, uh, we have now two different uh, off diagonal parameters for the overlap matrix, which are Q0, which represents in terms of the landscape, the size of the largest basin, 
and Q1, which represent the size of the innermost basin of attraction. And so as you can see from this matrix, since Q1 is larger than Q0 for the matrix properties, two larger overlaps correspond deepest and smaller um, attractors, uh, smaller, uh, sorry, uh, deepest and smallest uh, basin of attraction. So given these mathematical details, um, the next step is try to establish the phase diagram of the model. So as I said, this phase diagram was attained without demographic noise, uh, at a, which basically correspond to zero temperature for the heterogeneity parameter as a function of the mean interaction. Now we can pretend to add another dimension to the system, so to add a sort of temperature here. And we can uh, ask what about uh, the typical properties of the different phases? What are the emerging phase and what are the universality class of this emerging transition? So this is the resulting phase diagram that we found for the Lofka-Voltura model in high dimension with demographic noise where since I noticed that there is no sensitive dependence of the average interaction parameter that I call it mu, we can basically plot T, the amplitude of the demographic noise as a function of sigma, the heterogeneity parameter. And as you can notice in the high demographic noise regime, there is just one single equilibrium phase which means basically that the landscape is purely convex. And upon decreasing the uh, demographic noise, the system enters a multiple equilibria phase, which is characterized by this two level structure. And going deeper and deeper in T, in this amplitude, um, the system uh, undergoes another transition, which is represented by this instability orange line, which is the stability line of this multiple equilibria phase, where the system becomes amorphous, becomes marginally stable. So to find the critical line of this phase diagram, uh, what we did is to look at the harmonic, fl harmonic fluctuations of the free energy at finite demographic noise up to zero noise. And in particular, we look at the stability matrix, which is the matrix of the second derivative of the free energy with respect to this overlap parameter, QAB and QCD. And we diagonalize this matrix on a proper subspace, which is called a replicon, which, as you can see, provides the fluctuation between these two values, so the, these two cumulants of the average abundances. So this expression is a stability criterion for this single equilibrium phase. And so it allows us to obtain this blue line of the phase diagram. But this criterion can be basically and can be uh, in a straightforward way generalized to attain this other instability line for the one RSP for the one step replica symmetry breaking phase. And so to find the instability criterion for the multiple equilibria phase. So to recap the main properties of this phase diagram, as I said, um, we found no sensitive dependence of the average interaction parameter. So we can pretend to have a sort of cut of a three-dimensional phase diagram and just focus on a two-dimensional uh, plot on a two-dimensional diagram for the amplitude of the demographic noise as a function of the heterogeneity parameter. And now I want to enter into more detail of this multiple equilibria phase. So as I said, without demographic noise, this phase was not established, it was not explored into, uh, into many details. Um, and so what we can do is, for instance, perform a, a complexity or configurational entropy computation that in disorder system techniques basically correspond to compute the average, the average over the disorder of the log of the number of equilibria at the given free energy density in the limit as going to infinity. And so by performing this configurational entropy computation, we discovered that the number of equilibria in this phase is actually exponential into the system size, into the number of species, which is the first quantitative outcome in this direction and also confirms and also is also very timely in the light of stability landscape and ecological resilience concepts that have been proposed in ecology to explain this appearance of multiple steady state in real ecosystem. Another interesting feature concerns this last phase that I call it Gardner phase in analogy with spin glasses and glass system, because at very low demographic noise, this stable equilibrium becomes marginally stable. So each of these basin splits shutters into many sub basin according to a hierarchical structure. 
And this is also a first evidence of this space in this particular context, because as I said, I performed previous studies in another model of ecosystem. So in high dimensional MacArthur model, but I didn't find there any uh, particular evidence, any signature of a symmetry breaking effect and a particular Gardner phase. So why is this phase so important, so relevant in disorder system and in particular in glassy system? So to better explain the properties of this phase, um, I want to briefly mention the phase diagram that we can have in a glassy system. So here I consider a system of a hard sphere in infinite dimension that are for instance constrained to, to be in a given box. And so you can also rephrase this reasoning in terms of soft sphere where the control parameter becomes the temperature. So here I'm considering specifically R sphere in infinite dimension. And so the control parameter is the packing fraction, is the, uh, the density. So as you can see at low density, the system is in the liquid phase. So the phase space is completely ergodic and the dynamics at long times uh, after a ballistic regime is purely diffusive. Then upon increasing this density, this packing fraction, the system enters a normal glassy phase, meaning that each, uh, meaning that this ergodic condition is basically broken, uh, and so a lot of cluster appear. So this is called a dynamical transition or clustering transition, meaning that this delta, so the the, the size of each cluster, basically correspond to the amplitude of vibration in particle uh, of particles inside each cage where particles are confined. But as it was discovered in 2014, in glassy system, it can exist another transition that is specifically called the Garner transition, meaning that each of these basin, each of these cluster splits charters in another structure, so in a hierarchical structure of sub-basin, and takes a particular form. So it, it takes this particular form in the sense that each particle now is uh, associated to a given network structure, to a force network structure, which is provided by the particle in red. And so the properties of this phase is that is a marginally stable phase uh, and the dynamics is no longer diffusive in the sense that if you look, for instance, at the mean square displacement as a function of times, you will see a lot of plateau because the vibration as well are very heterogeneous in real space. So, so there are regions that are highly frozen in blue, and there are regions that are highly vibrating in red. So why this, pro why this phase is particularly interesting for us? Because in this marginal stability, the jamming transition that I uh, briefly mentioned at the beginning appears in, the, in this marginally glassy phase and is associated with critical properties and power load distribution with highly universal exponent. So given these details and given these uh, premises in terms of the static properties, in terms of the thermodynamics of this model, what we can claim in terms of the dynamics. So in terms of the dynamics, uh, we also studied the dynamical correlation function for the Lotka Volterra model with demographic noise. In particular, we look at this quantity, which has to be properly averaged over all random, uh, all sources of randomness. So over the initial condition, over the sampling set, over the random interaction and over the demographic noise. And so for uh, a long time, so for T greater than T weighting, we discovered that this correlation function uh, um, as a function of two different times, T and T prime, display different features, depending on whether we are looking at the single equilibrium phase or at the multiple equilibrium phase. So in the single equilibrium phase, this correlation function uh, is a function of this single time scale, T minus T prime, confirming that in this particular case, the dynamics is time translational invariant. And so as you can see, I reported here different curves some that are obtaining using that dynamical mean field theory simulation. So for different T prime. So as you can see the different correlation function, the different curves obtained for different T prime convert to the same value, which is the theoretical predicted value using the replica method, Q0. And I also plotted here that the correlation times, meaning that the stationary dynamics at a certain point uh, um, uh, display a divergent decorrelation times, uh, 
which goes as one over square root of epsilon, where epsilon is the distance to the transition to the one RSB uh, transition temperature. And indeed, uh, what happens in the multiple equilibria phase? So in the multiple equilibria phase, uh, the dynamics is no longer time translational invariant, meaning that the system uh, never settled down in any of these equilibria, but start to explore the basin of attraction of the most numerous marginally stable equilibria. And so as you can see, if you plot the correlation function, uh, this is no longer a function of a single time scale, but it's function of two different times, t and t prime. And if you plot the rescaled correlation function as a function of, of, uh, of the time interval, you see that the, the curves do not converge. So they display two different plateaus that correspond to the dashed uh, black line and the dashed red line, so Q0 and Q1, that can be again predicted using the replica method and using disorder assistance techniques. And so this is a particular feature uh, that reminds us an aging dynamics in midfield spin glass model. So the system never convert, never set down on any of these equilibrium, but start to explore these mesin that are now marginally stable. And so here I also compare this thermodynamic quantity that correspond to the average abundance and the high order moment of these abundances to the dynamical quantities. So in particular H, the average abundances correspond to the average population. And QD and Q0 that have been obtained in a thermodynamic approach correspond to the starting value, so the zero time value of the correlation function and the long time limit of this correlation function for tau going to infinity. And so as you can see, there is a remarkable agreement between the theory in orange and the numerics with the error bars in blue up to this, this dashed orange line. Uh, sorry, which correspond to the temperature at which ergodicity breaking effect start to appear and the dynamics is no longer time translational invariant. So our characterization of the different phases of this phase diagram and the dynamics can give insights, can give uh, can be useful also for explaining other models that are of, of interest in many different contexts, including mo notably models of population genetics, the analysis of Nash equilibria, for instance, in, uh, in econophysics, and also evolutionary game theory. So in particular, uh, we uh, decided to study this model, so the loft cavaltera model, without demographic noise and without immigration, because we... Um, we noticed that, that this model can be uh, mapped into a similar model that is called a random replicant model that describes the evolution of random replicants accord, uh, evolving according to random interaction. So on the left, you, uh, you can see the Hamiltonian of the loft cavaltera model without demographic noise and without immigration. And on the right, you can see the Hamiltonian of a random replicant model that was um, first proposed by Diederik and Doffer, and then reproposed by Biscari and Parisi in Biscari uh, master um, PhD thesis in, uh, yes, uh, 25 years ago. So the Hamiltonian of the random replicant model, as you can see, is almost the same of the Hamiltonian of the loft cavaltera model. So the only difference is that here we have a global quadratic constraints that multiply this parameter A, and we have an additional constraints over the concentration of the species abundances. So the total number of concentration is forced to be equal to S, to the total number of species. And so in this particular case, we decide to uh, establish a direct mapping, an exact mapping between the two models. And the exact mapping is obtained in this box. So essentially, we notice that this parameter A that multiply the global quadratic constraints is nothing but the sigma, so the heterogeneity parameter in our case. And gamma, which is the Lagrange multiplier introduced in the random replicant model to enforce these uh, constraints over the total number of concentration, the overall concentration of the species, is nothing but this interaction parameter mu. And so as you can see, there is no qualitative difference in the phase diagram without demographic noise and without immigration. So if I plot now the temperature, which is a true temperature now, uh, we can still recognize three different phases. So a single equilibrium phase, a one RSP stable phase where these two level structure 
starts to appear and a marginally stable uh, phase where the equilibria becomes marginally stable. And so there is, uh, as I said, there is no qualitative difference. And this point in red correspond to the initial phase diagram that I show that was first attained by Guy Boone in, in 2017. And then now, as the last question, one can ask about this lofka volterra model, uh, one can wonder what should we, what should we expect if we put, if we introduce a small degree of asymmetry in this interaction matrix? How we should expect this phase diagram to change? Well, the first two phases, the single equilibrium phase and the multiple equilibria phase, phase should not be uh, changed, should not be perturbed by a small and infinitesimally small degree of asymmetry because the equilibria here are stable. Whereas this marginal stability phase, this Garner phase, should be completely washed out because of the marginal stability property of the equilibria there. And then I can also claim that if we don't consider demographic noise, this uh, intermediate phase uh, at high sigma, so at high heterogeneity, should be replaced by an exponential number of chaotic attractors because of the properties of the uh, of the asymmetric properties of this matrix. So this concludes the first part of my talk. And for the second part of my talk, I want to touch up on another problem uh, that, as I said, is based on a, a recent uh, paper that we posted on archive this week. So it's how to model cooperative interaction in large ecosystems. So the starting point is always the same, this dynamical equation for the relative species abundances Ni, where we slightly modify this one species potential with an high order single species potential, so an high order a cubic potential in the species abundances that basically modify the logistic growth rate uh, by multiplying uh, by this term Ni minus N. And then in jargon is called a threshold or specifically a, tre a Lee threshold because provided this choice of the one species potential, we manage now to model the so-called Dali effect that is identified by a positive correlation between population density and mean individual fitness or per capita growth rate, as you can see in this plot. So in this particular plot, um, I show two different situations that correspond to a weak Ali effect in orange and a strong Ali effect in red. So what is the difference? So starting from this, uh, by tuning this parameter M, we can basically switch, we can basically move from a weakly effect corresponding to a negative or zero value of this parameter M and a strongly effect that correspond to a positive value of M. So to the existence of a population threshold below which the population goes extinct. So if uh, the population is below this threshold, there is a, um, the system will tend to the fixed point in zero, which correspond to the extinction. But if the population is above this threshold, the system will tend to the other fixed point, which correspond to the current capacity, which is a stable fixed point. So this effect was proposed uh, one century ago, more or less, by Alim was a famous zoologist who first noticed that not only competition but also undercrowding in many species can limit uh, can contribute to limiting population growth and in particular this effect is caused by exploitation difficulties uh, predator saturation uh, genetic disease it has been empirically confirmed in many population in many marine population mammals reptiles insects but more recently, it has been shown of, um, uh, of being particularly relevant also for other models, uh, for instance, in cancer cell evolution and epidemiology. And in particular, a strong Ali effect um, observed in basic epidemiological model can give rise to very rich dynamics, um, leading to self-sustained oscillation or catastrophic, equili uh, catastrophic collapses of the endemic equilibrium. So it's under up the centrality is also linked to a better understanding of mechanisms that govern cancer cell evolution and epidemiology. And so one missing piece now is try to establish a, a more rigorous, a more detailed framework for explaining this Ali effect. 
And so, as I said, we consider this uh, generalization of the logistic growth based on the introduction of a high order potential. And we established the phase diagram for the amplitude of the demographic noise as a function of this heterogeneity parameter. And we noticed it here just uh, a distinction uh, between two different phases, a single equilibrium phase where the landscape is purely convex again, and a multiple equilibria phase, in particular in orange for a strong Ali effect and in green for a weak Ali effect. But to better understand the properties of this multiple equilibria phase uh, and to better uh, understand whether this phase is determined by a continuous or a continuous transition in the order parameter, we need to perform a perturbative expansion close to this critical line, and in particular to look at the stability condition. So we brought, we write now the, the free energy in terms of a free energy functional, which is function of this continuous parameter Qx and this diagonal value Qd. And we look at this uh, quantity, which are called the breaking point and the slope evaluated at the breaking point that, as you can see, basically correspond to the cumulants of this free energy functional. And so given this uh, quantity, so um, using this um, the information from these two quantities, uh, we can uh, point it out that there is no evidence here at variance with the loft cavalterra, the basic loft cavalterra with logistic growth case of an amorphous gardener like face here. So we can just uh, distinguish here two different phases. So a continuous transition to a single equilibrium phase where uh, formally, uh, which formally correspond to a replica symmetric phase to a phase where um, the system is marginal and the symmetry is broken infinitely many times. So to recap uh, the main difference with the loft cavalterra model, in the loft cavalterra model, we have just two single equilibria. So an equi a fixed point in zero, which corresponds to an unstable equilibrium, an unstable uh, fixed point, and another fixed point in the carrying capacity, which is a stable fixed point, uh, irrespective of the plugged in uh, interaction parameter. Here, instead, in the, in the Ali effect, we have a different situation. So if we consider this dynamical equation and we focus on the no interaction case, so we focus in particular on this uh, gradient term, so we look at the, at the fixed point in the case in the presence of an Ali effect, in the presence of an Ali effect, we have basically three fixed points. So the globally asymptotic and stable fixed point for the loft cavalterra model becomes now stable. So the globally asymptotic and stable fixed point in zero in the strong Ali effect becomes a stable and neutral stable fixed point. And on top of that, another fixed point emerge that corresponds to what I call it before an Ali threshold. So an intermediate fixed point, which is an unstable fixed point. And then we still have another fixed point here that corresponds to the current capacity, which is a stable fixed point. So at variance with the loft cavalterra model, as I said, in the, in the specific case of a strong Ali effect, we have three fixed points. And in terms of the phase diagram, we can just recognize, we can just distinguish two different phases, a single equilibrium phase and a multiple equilibria phase, both for the strong and the weak Ali effect, without no evidence of a Gardner phase. And there is another important difference. So in terms of the functional response of this uh, system in the presence of an Ali effect. So in the case of the loft cavalterra model, um, the response function does not depend uh, on the probability distribution of the species abundances. So it's a non-fluctuating quantity. Conversely, in the Ali effect, the response function, as it should be uh, correctly expected, the response function does depend on the species abundance distribution. And so in the last part of my talk, uh, I want to briefly uh, explain um, how we can link the marginal stability properties of the fuller SB phase of this marginal phase with the appearance of a pseudo gap distribution in the probability distribution of the effective field of the curvature of the effective field. So we specifically study this Ali effect in the zero demographic noise regime, so uh, which co basically corresponds in this order system to the zero temperature limit to the zero temperature regime. And we specifically study the species abundances distribution. So as you can see from this pictorial representation, uh, I'm considering a Gaussian model of two uh, couplet double well potential. 
that are joined by a fictitious spring. And so because of this interaction, the two dimensional uh, potential that is projected on an N1 and N2 plane uh, has minima in two completely different position with respect to the original three dimensional potential. So to study the properties of the probability distribution as a function of the local curvature of this effective potential, we perform two different strategies. So a dynamical cavity approach and a Gaussian model of coupled potential, of interacting potential. And so uh, we consider in particular the introduction of a given uh, field of a, an additional species in a given site, and we manage to attain a condition for marginal stability on this model. So as I said, we, since we are interested in the harmonic fluctuation of these effective potential that are also minimal, so for the marginal stability condition, we consider this assumption. So we consider the local curvature of this effective potential that should be minimal, together with these other assumption on the probability distribution. And so we found the condition for the curvature of this effective potential. So a distribution uh, P as a function of the local curvature of this effective potential with a pseudo gap with an exponent alpha um, should satisfy a particular condition. So uh, implies that the minimal effective potential that one can, one can find are of order one over N where this exponent has to be one over uh, one plus alpha. So this basically means that if alpha is less than one, the system is definitely unstable. Whereas is alpha is this exponent's alpha is greater or equal than one, the system is stable. And so alpha equal one is a limiting condition because it provides a condition for marginal stability. So to conclude, um, I presented today basically two models. So a basic lofka Volterra model um, in which I uh, perform a thermodynamic, both a thermodynamic and a dynamical analysis to show that the phase diagram can be characterized in terms of three different phases. So a single equilibrium phase, a multiple equilibria phase, an intermediate multiple equilibria phase where the equilibria are stable and exponential into the number of species. And at a very, very low demographic noise, a Gardner phase in analogy with jamming of amorphous system and glassy system in the low temperature regime. Then I also generalize this model to the random replicant models can, can be useful in many, many different contexts that include notably the analysis of niche equilibria and evolutionary game theory. And in the second part of the talk, um, I try to generalize this uh, loft cavalter equation with logistic growth to explain how to uh, model cooperative interaction in large ecosystem, and in particular to explain this weak and strong Ali effect that can be particularly useful uh, in epidemiological models and in marine population, in bacterial community, in a microbial, microbial community. And so uh, in the last part, um, I explain how this model um, in the presence of a weak or a strong Ali effect can display completely different features with universality class that belong to, uh, um, with transition, emerging transition that belong to a completely different universality class. And then for the future, um, uh, there are different perspectives that could be uh, interesting to, um, to follow in the, in the near future, in particular performing theoretical analysis of this phase diagram and these models with stronger interaction. To, uh, to better investigate uh, what are the typical behaviors that can emerge, um, whether periodic cycles or intermittent dynamics can emerge, and also introduce a notion of space in this system that allow to properly model, to properly explain cooperative interact, uh, cooperative pattern formation and directed percolation phenomena. Because in this particular model, uh, in, in addition, so in, in presence of spa sp spatial fluctuation, new interesting phenomena can appear. And now I would like to conclude and to thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, so the talk is open for discussion and questions or comments. And if anybody would like to say anything, just unmute yourself and, and, and speak. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your for your talk. I well, I have a number of questions. I, I will try to be brief. First, I I lost the relationship of the different minima or different equilibrium in all phase you have with the biological meaning of species. 
for example, when you have the, the single, single minimum phase or the multiple, the governor phase, what does it mean for the in terms of ecosystem and species? Okay. Uh, in particular, and in, one is usually in biology interested in which species are extinct and which are not. I, I don't know, in this mean field approach, you can distinguish these type of things. So what can you say about that? Okay. Um, okay, so in this particular case, so this is a first, Quantitative, this is a first quantitative evidence in these mean field models. So what we can say is basically, as I said at the very beginning, this loft cavaltera model has been recently recognized in this paper by Barbier, Arnoldi, Bonin, and Michel Loro, who is a, a theoretical ecologist. It has been recently recognized and acknowledged to be a good platform, a good reference model for explaining many different features for various community models. And in particular, the, the parameter that you can tune in a real ecosystem, for instance, in a model of plants or forest, are the, these interactions, so the mean and the variance of these interaction matrix, the variance of the carrying capacity that you can also consider as a fluctuating quantity, and the asymmetry parameter, so the correlation between these alpha j and alpha ji. But, uh, um, Essentially, the different community models, so cascade prediction, plant pollinators, resource consumers model, can be uh, perfectly uh, captured by the loft cavaltera model, even in high dimension. So this is for the for the second question, and for the first question, in terms of the the different equilibria that you can recognize in this model. So a, a typical example, uh, a typical uh, uh, control experimental setup uh, correspond, for instance, to take a chemostat in which you vary the availability of nutrients. So a typical system that you can study is a, um, a system of microbes, a microbial community ecosystem, because for two particular reasons, for two particular uh, advantage, because you can uh, have access of long evolutionary times and because you can study in vitro this community. And so you can, for instance, study what I call uh, the overlap parameter that represents the degree of similarity between two configurations of the same system. So you can, for instance, look at the differences in uh, uh, genotypic switching in an ecosystem. And as I said, another uh, controlled uh, experimental setup um, is to take a chemostat and to vary the availability of nutrients. So there are experiments by the group of Jeff Gore in particular uh, of last year and this year in which uh, they changed the availability of nutrients um, and they can uh, look at the biomass as a function of time. And so the, the number of nutrients basically correspond to changing uh, the uh, heterogeneity parameter in our model, in our phase diagram. So when you change the number of nutrients, you are basically entering this multiple equilibria phase because different steady state can, are more likely, can more likely emerge. Well, the, just, just to, to, to point better this question, just uh, can you say, can you calculate how many species uh, are alive and how many of them are extinct in this framework? <laughs> or, or do you only take average values so you average abundances so you don't know which uh, ones? Yeah, in this means... Yeah, in this mean field model, actually, I'm taking the average abundance and the ever. Yeah, this is a tricky part because um, I'm consider. Sorry, I want to go to the next slide. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, this one. So basically, I'm considering the average abundance and the high order moment of this abundance. But if you perform, for instance, a dynamical simulation by using, as I said, a dynamical mean field theory approach, you can also look at the population as a function of time. And so in this particular case, you can try to, uh, to see how many uh, species are going extinct. And it, as I said, uh, to prevent species uh, to get very, very close to the boundary to an, an uh, Ni equal zero, we, we impose an arc or repulsive boundary. So if you look, if you, Use, for instance, a dynamical mean field theory approach and you perform a dynamical simulation, yes, you can have access to this kind of information. And you have other questions that perhaps other people ask, and then there is time we can talk about. So, um, does anybody else want to ask a question? <laughs> 
as you, as you just heard, Emilio has more, but now is your chance to get a question in if you if you'd like to ask one or a comment. Well, then, Emilio, go go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, at several points of the talk, I've been confused with the okay. symmetry or asymmetry mm -hmm. of the alphas of the interactions. For example, in, there, there are several places that, for example, in the next slide, the slide 913, uh, yes. you, you say that when you when alpha gets some uh, slightly asymmetric part, then the, the phase, uh, one of the phases completely changes. But I don't understand this because you compute this phase diagram with the my computer, the statistical mechanics with, the, with this Hamiltonian. In this Hamiltonian, uh, is, if you add a, a, a non-symmetric part to alpha, uh, this non-symmetric part vanishes. So it's not, this Hamiltonian doesn't depend on the symmetric part of alpha. So I don't understand the statement of... Okay, okay. Part so, of that symmetric part. Yeah, maybe it was too fast. So basically, uh, to write the Hamiltonian, so to write the Lyapunov function, uh, we need to have symmetric interaction. So we start with the assumption to have alpha j equal to alpha ji, and we can perform a thermodynamic analysis. And in particular, we can manage, we manage to attain this phase diagram. So this phase diagram specifically, and uh, the complete thermodynamical analysis has been obtained for uh, uh, alpha j equal to alpha ji. So then one can try to, to, to explore other perspective, and then one can wonder what are the properties, how <laughs> Phase diagram, how should we expect this phase diagram to change when we slightly perturb this alpha j? And so there are uh, studies in this direction, performance, for instance, in neural networks. So in uh, spin glass models with neural network by Hertz and uh, uh, Sola um, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, in which they uh, prove by using a, a dynamical approach in which they prove that this spin glass phase which is a marginally stable uh, phase, should be completely washed out because of the properties of this matrix, alpha j. Okay, but this is not done with this Hamiltonian. So it's done no, with no, no, no. We, 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 we cannot do this study because actually we cannot write a Lyapunov function. So the only way to write a Lyapunov function is to assume that these alpha j are symmetric. What we can do again uh, is to perform a, a dynamical mean field theory approach or a, a dynamical cavity approach. In this case, you can also uh, address uh, this other question. You can uh, consider this alpha j as asymmetric variables. And so you can try to study the different phases in a dynamical approach when you don't need to have a Lyapunov function. Mm -hmm. And so in this particular case, I mentioned at a certain point that if we introduce a small degree of asymmetry, this phase has been shown, has been proven to be replaced by an exponential number of chaotic attractors. You can find this study. There is a recent paper by um, Felix Roy, Giulio Biroli. Um, so there is a dynamical uh, computation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So uh, th this is actually, I was going to ask that how, if I, this is some sort of analysis, well, a replica analysis of some energy landscape, right? So, mm -hmm. but if I actually run the Lotka Volterra system, so I just solve the differential equation numerically, how, how can I distinguish these phases, right? So, the replica symmetric phase, if I understand this correctly, you, you go to the same fixed point no matter how you start. Exactly. Yeah. If you. And then, and yeah, if you perform a dynamical simulation, you are basically looking at this correlation function. And so in the single equilibrium phase, you always find the same equilibrium. So you will tend to this value, which is Q0, that can be predicted analytically. So but you will converge always to the same equilibrium because the landscape is purely convex and is characterized by one single equilibrium. But when you why, go- Why does that mean, sorry, why does that mean, so this, you're correlating e, N of T, N of T prime, and you're saying, how do I, this goes to some value, I don't know. How do I, how do I conclude from that that I go to the same equilibrium? Uh, we see this from numerical simulation. So we consider mm -hmm. this correlation function at different uh -huh. times. And we see that this correlation function does not depend separately on two times, but it's just a, a, a time translational invariant quantity. So they will tend at different T prime, the curves collapses to the same value. Mm -hmm. which is 
So in the mean field theory approach is the degree of similarity. So it's essentially the size of the basin. For this reason, I call it this Q0, but it's the value that you can theoretically and analytically predict. And if you go deeper and deeper in the phase diagram, so what you can see when you run in your simulation is that you don't, your curves do not collapse, do not converge to the same value, but start to display these different plateaus. Okay. So but, but, okay. Hmm. but an ecologist who, who, so an ecologist doesn't know anything about aging and things like how would they, they, so they would not be able to see the difference, right? They would just. Hmm. Well, this quantity this. <laughs> zero QD can be related, for instance, to the, to the different species that you can find in your ecosystem. So in uh, ecology specifically, it's difficult to find a, a mean field system no because for instance in microbial right. community also the experiments that i mentioned before by jeff gore and his collaborators mm -hmm. um is considering species up to 24 30 species so they are uh, quite small but you can still look at quantities that uh, remind somehow this overlap parameter q0 q mm -hmm. Because you can, you can, for instance, look so specifically, you can look at the fluctuation of the species abundances. So we can also look in these models to the uh, susceptibility. So in particular, the dynamical susceptibility that is called chi 4 And so uh, you can look at the fluctuation uh, of the species abundances as a function of time. So this dynamical quantity, and you can see at a certain point if this uh, susceptibility are going to diverge or not. And so this is a signature of a critical phase. Okay. That, you, hmm. Is there, anybody else have any other questions? I had a question. Ah, Joe, yeah, go ahead. On slide eight. Uh, you, you had, I think you wrote down kind of an explicit uh, criterion for the transition into each of these phases, I think. Yes. Um, so, so lambda equals something or something like this at the bottom here. Yeah. I, I, I didn't understand this criterion um, and it, it sounded quite important. So is, is this like a, an eigenvalue or something? Yes, or, exactly. Um, could, could you tell me a little bit about this, how, yeah. how you define these transitions, please? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It was very fast because it's a very technical detail. So basically, uh, to attain this phase diagram and to attain the critical, so the blue line and the orange line, um, I perform a stability computation. So I look at the second derivative of this free energy, uh, derived, uh, differentiated with the respect to QAB and QCD. And so this uh, stability matrix um, contains a first diagonal part, um, and an off-diagonal part that can be written as the connected part of this correlation function that depends on the species abundances replicated, replicated uh, species abundances. And so now you have to diagonalize this matrix uh, on a proper subspace. And so in the replica uh, formalism, this matrix is, can be basically diagonalized uh, in terms of three different eigenvalues that are called the replicon, the longitudinal, and the, and the anomalous. So the replicon eigenvalue is the smallest eigenvalue, is the leading eigenvalue that uh, uh, can give information of <coughs> replica symmetry breaking effect. And so how a, a different transition can take place. So this is called a replicon eigenvalue, and you, you have a, a, a specific structure, a, a specific methodology, method, uh, method, a specific strategy to diagonalize this matrix in the replica in the replica space so in the simplest scenario that corresponds to the replica symmetric phase the replica takes this form and so is one that corresponds to this term minus beta rho which is the ratio between the growth rate and the current capacity sigma which is the heterogeneity parameter to the power to the second power and then you have the fluctuation of these two quantities why because basically this connected correlation function uh, um, has to be diagonalized on the different subspaces. So you have to consider, for instance, the pair A, B equal to C, D, A, B um, equal to just one of these index. So you can have different combination of this correlation function. 
So when all the indexes are equal or when part of these inter indexes are different. And so you end, up, you end up with this expression that contains basically the fluctuation of QD, so the, the, um, uh, the self overlap and Q0, which is the off diagonal value of the overlap. Mm -hmm. So it's, basic, uh, it's basically the fluctuation between these two values, QD, which is on the diagonal and Q0, which is on the off diagonal. And so why um, are we specifically look at this eigenvalue? Because it's the first eigenvalue that can touch zero. And so this eigenvalue is basically connected to the lower edge of the spectrum. If you look, for instance, at the uh, distribution of eigenvalue. And so uh, a vanishing behavior, a vanishing trend of this replicon eigenvalue can give information uh, of marginal stability property. Because you know that when uh, the lower edge of the spectrum of a random matrix touches zero, there is essentially an excess and abundance of uh, zero modes. And so it's again, a signature of a critical phase. Okay, very nice. And, and so this eigenvalue, this is kind of related, I suppose, to the, the relaxation time of the system to, towards this, this single equilibrium. Is that right? Uh, Yes, yes, yeah, okay. yeah, I agree. Yeah, at a certain point, I also show uh, this relaxation time, uh, yes, in this slide, because also we also perform this study. And so essentially when, uh, um, uh, so at, uh, in the single equilibrium phase, the dynamics is stationary, okay? And at a certain point, uh, the dynamics is no longer stationary. And so you can associate uh, at this condition, uh, a, relax a decorrelation time, uh, which is diverging. So a divergent relaxation times that goes one as one over square root of epsilon, where epsilon is the distance to the transition, to the transition T minus T1 RSB. A T1 RSB is basically the temperature at which this multiple equilibria phase starts to appear. So the answer is yes. Okay, thank you very much. I will uh, read your paper to find all the details. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So I think we have uh, exhausted the time. So unless there's somebody has a very urgent question, I propose that we thank Ada again. Thank you. For thank this, you. Uh, for this thank talk. Very much. And then, um, um, yeah, and I'm very sorry that we now just have to close the session. It would be much nicer to have you here in person, but. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, do this another time. Um, so thank you again, and thanks thank everyone you very for coming. Much for the invitation. It was Bye. very nice. Bye. Bye.